First, uh, thank you all for joining. I'm gonna introduce Carrie, who I have met personally in Phoenix, uh, got to know him and his wife and their uh, children. In fact, my, my last Phoenix memory <laughs> of Carrie was meeting him in Walgreens. I think it was the night before his flight and uh, just getting whatever last meds he needed for that trip out of Arizona. But we've kept up contact. And in fact, Carrie, Steve Chauvin can't be on, but he sends regards. And uh, Carrie, as he'll share about himself, came to Arizona. If you work in the FBI and you do this type of diplomatic missions, uh, and anything I say incorrectly, you'll definitely correct. Um, you have to do a stint in the United States in between these um, foreign missions. And that's why I met Carrie while he was uh, in Phoenix. So Carrie has brought on his friend and colleague, Rusty Rosenthal, who is actually the current legal attache to the state of Israel. Um, which is a role that Carrie played as well. So I'm introducing both of you. I'm going to spotlight both of your screens and you'll be able to share however you'd like uh, and however you want to start and present that. So thank you both for joining. I know that you have many other big fish to fry in your roles. So thank you. Uh, with pleasure. Rusty, you're not muted, are you? Can you, can you take it off mute if you're muted? I'm not muted. Okay, perfect. So um, with your permission, um, Rusty and I will, will give a presentation. First off, thanks to everybody for taking time out of your busy days, if they are busy during this horrible pandemic. Uh, I'll introduce myself and, and my background, and then Rusty will do the same. Uh, Rusty and I lived together in Israel for quite some time, and we've uh, done these presentations many times. Uh, I've never done one as a retired FBI agent, which I am now, so I can go all in while Rusty won't be able to go all in. But uh, we're, 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 we'll try to be as professional as we can. Normally it devolves into a Laurel and Hardy type presentation. Um, totally. But, but uh, what'll, what will be great is, you know, like, why does the FBI uh, serve overseas? Why do FBI special agents serve abroad? W what's it like for us to serve in Israel? And I think, you know, for, for a, a Chabad group like this, I, I, I think uh, you'll, you'll find it fascinating. So I'll just quickly tell my story and then Rusty will tell his. We'll talk a, a little bit about what the FBI does in Israel and what we do abroad. And then to make this a little bit more fun for everybody, rather than just have us talk to you, it'd be helpful to uh, hear your questions, concerns, issues. Um, so I'm, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, the son of a taxi driver. Um, my, my, I grew up uh, in an Orthodox setting. My grandfather was a very religious man, in fact, was the president of a shul in Brooklyn, and then uh, president of a, an Orthodox shul in North Miami Beach. Uh, and um, I went to college in Tampa, Florida, wanting to be a baseball player and marine biologist, but realized uh, I didn't have talent in baseball and studying plankton in the middle of the Indian Ocean with a PhD would earn me $15,000 a year. So I switched to finance and quickly got a job on Wall Street with Merrill Lynch. And that's how I came to know uh, a good friend of the Levertov, Steve Chauvin, who, who was a, a legend in the FBI at the time. So for those of you who know him, I, I can confirm that Steve is a, is a very special man and uh, was held in the highest regard on Wall Street long, long ago. Uh, well, the stock market crashed in 1987 and I lost everything I had and decided to join the army, right? So I, I went from making six figures on Wall Street to making $15,000 a year and just absolutely loved it and thought, how can I serve my country uh, when the time in the military ended and decided to, to join the FBI. Uh, why the FBI? Um, I grew up watching Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. and thought, okay, I'll be Inspector Erskine for a little while and then try something else. Uh, but it was uh, just the, the greatest decision uh, I ever made other than marriage and having children. I'm going to have Rusty smile because he knows my bride and I know his. Uh, 
And I started my journey in Tucson, Arizona, when I called my father from Quantico, Virginia, again, a taxi driver and said, uh, the FBI assigned me to Tucson, Arizona, T Tucson. He asked me, is that in America? So uh, moved down to Tucson and worked crime on the Southwest border and, and on the Indian reservations in Tucson, the Indian reservation back then was known as the Papago. And as a, as a Wall Street guy um, with a, a white collar background, going onto an Indian reservation and investigating homicides and crimes against children and just uh, the, the, the most horrific things you could imagine was certainly uh, an eye-opening experience. Uh, loved my life in Tucson, but I was this cocky, brash New Yorker, which fit in very well with an undercover assignment. Uh, and I was asked to uh, move to Phoenix and portray um, the role of an environmental engineer, where I was ultimately bribed by um, organized crime. And uh, I, I did a deep cover there for, for a year and it was a, a really fascinating experience. Why do I talk about this? Because um, it was a successful undercover case. And as soon as I came out of it, the director of the FBI at the time, Louis Free, was expanding internationally, uh, really to combat Russian organized crime. But he decided to open the 36th office of the FBI in Tel Aviv, Israel. And because of the success of the undercover assignment, I was selected to, to move to Israel. Um, but it was only for a six month period to plant the flag and went there in 1996 and met with the Mossad and the Israeli security agency, also known as the Shin Bet. That's the domestic service. The Mossad is like the external intelligence service, like the CIA, the Shin Bet is like the FBI and the Israel police. And I, I found my calling in life uh, and realized that I wanted to serve with the FBI abroad and, uh, and if possible, to, to serve time in, in Israel. So I'll stop there for a second and then I'll talk more about the experiences in Israel. But uh, Rusty, please uh, give, give your background. You have a fascinating background and family and, and, and then I'll talk again. Thanks. So thank you all for having me uh, join you. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and uh, it's nice to see people uh, back home and in the US, uh, which I do miss dearly. Um, I'll be brief so that we can talk about things that you all want to talk and hear about. And, and, and uh, so I'll just be very short. So my background, um, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, uh, the son of a dentist and uh, was raised like since junior high, like I was going to be a lawyer. I was, that's what I was supposed to be. So I, I uh, went to Duke University for undergraduate and then went directly uh, to law school in uh, Washington, D.C. at Georgetown and, and quickly realized that it was not going to be uh, the, the, the career for me, the profession, and it certainly wasn't a uh, calling. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know what your experiences are, but until then, you, you never really thought about what you really wanted to do. You just sort of kept checking the boxes and, and uh, succeeding academically and going on to the next step. And then all of a sudden I was faced with uh, graduation and I really needed to decide, uh, you know, something that I, that I could find that could make me happy. And um, I actually had looked into the FBI, this is 1994 when I was graduating and um, arranged with our, uh, like the career guidance uh, office at, at the law school to bring in an FBI agent to, to speak, uh, to some classmates of mine. Um, so, and it, and it sort of furthered my interest and I, I started doing some research that um, back in the days of, um, of uh, Ephraim Zimbalis, actually all uh, FBI agents were uh, lawyers and accountants um, in, in the early days. And that had just sort of piqued my interest. And, you know, of course that's not true today. It's a, it's a much more diverse uh, population uh, like the community we serve. But um, anyway, I did go back to Ohio. I practiced law for a year to confirm my, my darkest suspicions that I was going to not like it. Uh, I then, uh, but the, the FBI had a hiring freeze at the time. So I was really in a jam and had to find something to do. So while I was waiting for the applications to start moving in, I, I became a, uh, a prosecutor, a local prosecutor 
like I said, in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio, which I actually did enjoy very much. And I always wonder if I would have been doing that first directly out of law school, I wonder if it would have changed my whole life because I probably wouldn't have been looking so hard at, at, at doing something else. But in the meantime, I had already applied to the FBI and then I, I was accepted uh, two years later. Um, like I said, one, once the, uh, the log jam uh, started to clear out after the uh, hiring freeze uh, back in the mid nineties, um, I was assigned back to Washington DC uh, as my first office. And like I said, I had been in law school there, but everybody, when you go to Washington, D.C., uh, because it's Washington, D.C., you get assigned to national security violations. I joined the FBI thinking I was going to work public corruption, and I'd been a criminal prosecutor, and I brought all this expertise, and I've never worked one day of that. And, and uh, that, that's sort of how it goes in, in, in the government, but especially in the FBI sometimes. Um, but I started working uh, counterintelligence and, and espionage matters. Um, but one of the great things about being in a big office like our Washington field office is that you get exposure to some of the international aspects of the FBI and some of our overseas investigations. Um, for a while, I was uh, doing computer forensics, and I was able to travel to Athens, Greece uh, in preparation for the, what Olympics was there, 2004? No, no, I don't even remember now. Anyway, whatever Olympics were in Athens, um, I was able to travel abroad, um, and it was my first exposure uh, to this presence that the FBI had overseas, and I was able to meet the legal attache there and, and start learning about the work that he was doing. But in the back of my head, and my original plan was always to actually to be a lawyer for the FBI. So when I, I, when I started to progress a few years later in my career, I actually went to our headquarters um, in a legal, in a legal unit, in, in, in an uh, attorney position and uh, thought that's still where I was going to be heading uh, ultimately within the organization. But then I had an opportunity when the uh, current legal attache at the time in here in Tel Aviv happened to have departed, and his name happened to have been Kerry Gleischer, who I didn't know, by the way. But they needed um, the, his deputy at the time then took over the office, and they filled the position, the, the deputy position, with temporary uh, rotation of temporary people uh, for a while. And I had the opportunity to go out here. And like Carrie said, it, it didn't take long and it, it literally changed uh, certainly my career trajectory, but my entire life. And I too sort of got the, got the bug and knew that I wanted to serve um, the FBI and, and my country abroad. Um, so like I said, that was a temporary position, but I uh, thereafter applied for the permanent position here and came back as the deputy, um, but wanted to continue to serve. So when I left here uh, the first time, I then went to Afghanistan uh, for a year. Um, I've also served in uh, Sana'a, Yemen. Uh, I've been in Ethiopia uh, for extended periods of time. Um, and, and a couple other assignments. Uh, I then went back and I did my supervisory desk time as a, as a cyber uh, investigation supervisor in, in the Newport Beach in Southern California out of our Los Angeles division uh, and then came back here again when I actually worked for Kerry and then my most recent assignment before I came back here this time I was um, the unit chief in our internal operations overseeing 10 of our Middle East offices uh, including Tel Aviv uh, obviously and then uh, instead of joining Kerry in retirement I came back out here uh, one last time to run the office and uh see if I can improve upon it. But it's been an amazing uh, career, um, this particular job uh, in particular, but, but serving in this organization and, and, and our country has, has been a, a pleasure and, and real honor. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Carrie and we can take questions that you all have. Thank you, Rusty. So I wound up serving three tours in Israel for a total of 11 years. I've also represented the FBI in Singapore and Austria. Um, my daughter was born in Israel, my son in Austria. When we moved to Singapore, I told my wife, let's have a third. And she said, you just want to tell people you had three children in three different countries. Um, before leaving for Israel the first time, uh, I went through Hebrew training. And it was the first time I learned Hebrew uh, post bar mitzvah. And the instructor, this was during the Intifada, the instructor wanted to know if I wanted to learn how to say suicide belt or bomb or, or what, what words do you want to learn? And I said, tell me how to, how to get an Israeli wife. 
So, um, so I learned Shalom, Shmi Kari. Hi, my name is Kari. Ani Oved Shegerut Amerikait. I work at the U.S. Embassy. Ani Sochen Sodi. I'm a secret agent. And then with the great conclusion of Rotsa Visa. Do you want a visa to the United States? And I wound up marrying an Israeli. Rusty, Rusty wound up marrying an Israeli as well. So we have uh, very similar paths in life. Um, I'll tell you, I was, I was back in Washington, D.C., much like Rusty, I was a chief of international operations uh, when, when September 11th happened. And that, that changed the relationship uh, forever, I think, with the Israelis. I had served there as a deputy from 99 to 01 and went back there in 2002. So what changed? Um, uh, as I mentioned, when, when we went out there, was Louis Free was expanding uh, to combat Russian organized crime. And although we had a, a terrorist attack in the United States, um, the first World Trade Center in 1993, uh, you know, there was this feeling that, that the life that Israelis lead every day with buses flying in the air and, and restaurants um, being exploded by suicide or what we would call, and I don't like the word suicide bombers, a suicide terrorist. There's a, there's a, a far better word um, than, than suicide, they're homicide bombers. Um, but we, we woke up um, to, to understand and sympathize and empathize with what the Israelis go through and started to, to work far more closely with them. In, in fact, um, I was present in the room uh, about five days after, after September 11th, Robert Mueller had just become the director of the FBI and special, special prosecutor or special counsel Mueller, uh, who, who was a, a, a visionary and a wonderful man, uh, received a phone call from Avi Dichter, the, den, the then director of the Shin Bet, who said, you're never going to be able to solve the tragedy of September 11th by, by interviewing um, terrorist Arabic, uh, you know, the, 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 the terrorists at the time we knew were from the Arabian Peninsula and elsewhere. You, you must interview them, not the suicide terrorists, of course, but any, any of the co-conspirators, the collaborators, you, you must interview them in Arabic. And we didn't have many Arabic speakers at the time. So their relationship, Avi Dichter and Director Muller became very close and we wound up uh, collaborating with the Israelis very closely, uh, exchanging um, subject matter experts to understand what they knew and, and uh, how they dealt with uh, Arabic terrorism. And, and we exchanged our subject matter experts with them. So that was the dawn of a new relationship. And uh, we, we worked very closely with the Mossad. The Mossad, again, their external service um, focuses on, on, on problems outside Israel, obviously, and what would those problems be? Uh, Iran, uh, Arab terrorism, and with the, the Shin Bet inside Israel, Hamas in particular, and the threat from uh, the West Bank and Gaza, and even from Arab Israelis who are Israeli citizens. Uh, so we, we worked very closely with them, and we had a strong relationship with the Israel police, uh, on all things crime related. And in my last year serving there, I, I left in 2019 and Rusty can pick up on this. Um, we, we developed a, a very strong partnership in the, in the cyber realm and in, in high technology. Um, the relationship between the US government uh, and Israel on intelligence sharing and law enforcement matters is as strong as can be. Um, we're, we're two dynamic partners uh, who work very closely to keep uh, to keep our citizens and their citizens safe. Rusty, you want to piggyback any? Do you want me to pass the baton to you now to talk to talk about the relationship there in an unclassified way, of course? Well, I thought I'd share one anecdote that may, maybe people are familiar with. Uh, speaking of cyber, um, so you may remember a few years ago all the uh, bomb threats. Right, they were happening at uh, Jewish institutions and others all over the country. In fact, we had uh, at least one case um, 
right? When, when, you know, preschools were being evacuated, synagogues, you know, for, for days at a time because of these bomb threats, uh, we had at least one case, uh, one incident of these in, in all 56 of our field offices across the United States. So this was affecting everyone. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware, I mean, it's public now, but that, um, you know, after all the scare and fear mongering, it tur turned out in the end, I'll just cut to the chase. It was actually an Israeli uh, kid, really. He was, I don't know, 18, 19 years old, I think, um, here. But um, we had had uh, cyber specialists rotating through the office for some time at that time. But that particular case really, I'm advancing things because they, they were able to um, geolocate where the, where they thought the person was, uh, committing these acts from to a, you know, a, a certain radius, but they couldn't get any closer. And we were able to come out and help them, um, uh, pinpoint exactly who it was. And, uh, that was a, an interesting case and I, and you're probably all familiar with it and, and it affected everybody. But, um, like Carrie said, since then, um, our cyber relationship in particular, has sort of been the, the growth industry like everywhere else. I mean, all, our other relationships and, and the areas that we work, uh, counterterrorism in particular, um, are always sort of at the forefront. But cyber is really the area where we've grown in the last few years. We, we took that position where we've had people rotating here for several years, and it's now a permanent position. So it, it, um, I have three deputies uh, that work for me here, um, and we basically um, – specialize them like one handles the counterterrorism matters for the most part one handles the cyber arena and another handles the criminal uh matters and um in fact today my my cyber deputy and i were down uh in the south of israel in beersheba where they have a national cyber directorate which is a big conglomerate in israel of their academic private and public sector where they all sit together and address um uh cyber matters both reactively obviously but also in hopefully more proactively and they're trying to sort of uh, grow that model and also uh, include international partners to that same thing. So we've done a lot of that um, as Carrie mentioned as you can imagine just be, be, because of where we are in the world um, counterterrorism is, is uh, I'd say our bread and butter that's really what we work on uh, the most and, it, and it's still the, the top priority. Um, for the FBI uh, in general, and, and obviously in, in this part of the world. So we, ha we, we do a lot of uh, mutual cases and intelligence sharing with, with all the services here in Israel uh, in that regard. And uh, I guess sadly, but not surprisingly, like, like anywhere, we also have a lot of uh, criminal investigations that we work together as well. Um, we, we, we do extraditions from here uh, with the Israelis. We, we run joint operations. We use each other's undercover uh, personnel and sources. So that's also a very um, robust uh, and productive relationship. Um, but it's often overshadowed by the counterterrorism elements just because it's it's always more uh, pressing and imminent threats uh, coming from that area. So we're, we're hitting the 30 minute mark and, and that's when people normally zone out. I, 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 before opening it up to questions, I, I left Israel in 2019 and moved to Guam. That was my last assignment with the FBI. I'm now living in Florida, retired uh, after 31 years in the FBI. Uh, I, can, I can say um, I had maybe three down days. It's been a, just a, a really wonderful journey. Um, I, I, I'm forever thankful to the, to the FBI, the organization, and the people that I've come to know. Uh, we, we, we do unbelievable things. Um, to keep people safe uh, around the world. And when tragic things happen, and they do, we respond and, and do our very best to solve the crimes. Um, but uh, to represent the, the, an organization that I love so much in Israel as a, as a Jew, um, highlight of career, perhaps highlight of life, uh, just a, a real great uh, spiritual, professional, and personal journey. And, uh, you know, I thank you for, for, for taking the time to listen to Rusty and me speak about our experiences. And if you have any questions, Rusty's living in Herzliya right now, so he can tell you what the weather's like or the, um, or the general mood in Israel, how Bibi's doing, wh whatever you'd like to talk about. 
Uh, Rusty loves talking politics, especially on an unclassified line. So please, any, uh, Levi, any, 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 anything you want to, yeah, any, so any before, questions? Before we take questions, yeah. um, I guess this is just some of the stuff that are coming up. How large, I guess there's really two questions. In general, legal attaches per country, is it always exclusively regarding uh, anti-terrorism or is there another role that they play? And then how large of a contingency of agents for example, for Israel and then other countries, do they have the same size? So I'll take this one. Okay, Garrett. So generally, no, no, the, the work is um, dictated by just where the most common ground between the, the FBI, right? Which, right, we are domestic law enforcement and intelligence agency. So what we're usually interested in, what we're working on is some kind of U.S. nexus to whatever it is. Um, the, the analogy I always like that explains it and, and it's, and it also answers your question. It's not just uh, counterterrorism matters, right? Is imagine just the basics of working criminal, you know, drug investigations, right? The war on drugs, you know, as we, I think we used to call let me call that anymore, but right. You, you, you can't just sit behind your fence line and fight this battle because it's just not effective. And what we learned very quickly, but actually had nothing, it was actually happened back in world war two, but we learned very quickly that to, to address the drug problem, you need to get out and work with your partners in the other countries. One, you need to try address the problem, you know, the drugs, for example, like in South America are coming from, but a lot of times you also need to build the capacity of your intelligence and law enforcement partners so that they can be better partners and help us solve our problems here. So a lot of what the FBI is doing uh, in less developed places than, than here in Israel, quite frankly, um, it's just a lot of training and you're just sort of, you're investing in, in creating capable partners so that you, you can then reap the benefits of that investment later, whether it's for, for information from relationships you've developed or just being able to rely on capable partners uh, abroad. Oh, what else did you say? Long? Sorry, so you asked about- Yeah, that was, no, that was yeah, perfect. The, then... the office, yeah, yeah, so sorry, so the, the size of the office um, again, it's just dictated by, by the work. That's, that's sort of a uh, ongoing dialogue that, that we have in, in the FBI and in, in our international operations division, right? Where do you put your resources? I mean, a lot, a lot of it may be just dictated by physical constraints in, in the embassy or the offices we have, but generally it's, it's just based on the work that we're doing. So uh, as I alluded to before here, here in Israel, this office used to be basically the boss, the legal attache, and one assistant legal attache, one, one, one deputy, and then an office manager. And that, that's back from when, when Kerry started this office in uh, 2096. No, I came in, 2000, in, in 1996. This office now has the legal attache, which is the position I have now, three deputies, as I mentioned, right, that, that handle the various subject matters, uh, counterterrorism, criminal, and cyber. We have an intelligence analyst, and then our office manager. So we've grown considerably. Um, some of our largest offices, I uh, think like London, uh, Ottawa, Canada, Mexico City, they are so large that they actually have the, the legal attache, it's the same title, but it's, it's actually a, a senior executive within the FBI. So it's actually a, a, a higher rank uh, than, than I am in, this, in the, the same position actually. And then they would have under them a, a, a deputy legal attache, which is actually the equivalent to uh, what we are rank wise. And they'd have several ALATs working for them. Um, so again, it just depends on the size um, of the office, in, which should be dictated by the work that is generated out of that office. Um, unfortunately, you know, in any bureaucracy, some of these things just sort of perpetuate themselves and, and and not a lot of thought goes in it, but that's something they're trying to address just in the last few years is really looking at where we're getting the value for our resources of, across the, the globe and where we need to reallocate resources when necessary. So before we go to some of the chat questions, um, you mentioned that it's, you know, there's the drug war, there's a lot of things that you're, do you, does that mean that you work hand in hand with some of the other federal agencies, DEA, um, whatever, I don't know if ATF is out of the states, but things like that. People do they have their own offices or are you their man? 
I missed that. Was it? Yeah. So the answer is yes. So, so, you know, we've always focused our job, right. As it's a liaison job, working with our, our foreign counterparts, but really another big aspect of the job is working with in the, in the embassy, right. In, in, within the country team, with the other agencies that are also represented, uh, represented um, in any given country. Now that, that differs. Like for instance, the DEA isn't present here in Israel. They cover uh uh, they're in Rome, right, Carrie? Or are they in uh, Cyprus? Anyway, same thing. Like like Secret Service. That, that some of the some of the offices are covered, or some of the countries are covered regionally, depending on how you know how much work uh, any given agency has. Now we do the same thing. We, the FBI, although we've expanded considerably in the last ten to fifteen years, we're not in every single embassy. In in some parts of the world, we'll, we will have a legal attaché, the FBI representative, sitting in one embassy in one country and covering uh, several countries out of that office. So they'll have to, um, especially uh, in those situations, cultivate the relationships within the embassy because they really rely on them to help um, with, the, with, the, with the foreign uh, liaison also when they are, when they get, can go visit those, uh, those areas, those countries. All right, so thank you. And that's, that clarifies it. I'm gonna go through some of the chat questions. Hopefully you'll be able to do, um, answer all of these if they're, uh, able, if you're able to, I'll go on the order of how they're asked. So one of them was to the extent that you can discuss, please address the continued threat from Iran and its malign behavior that threatens Israel and the stability of the region. And again, you don't have to make, I don't want it to be too long. So it doesn't, cause that could be a two hours, three hours presentation on its own. Um, <laughs> So maybe it's more about how you get involved. Like Gary take it since he's retired. <laughs> I don't want to get. I don't want to get Rusty fired. <laughs> okay, I can be real also, Gary, when you do answer that, um, I guess in addition to how you answer that, if you can, I guess address how the FBI legal attaché involves itself in that. Uh, your 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 last question was a good one because you mentioned ATF and DEA. Uh, what the. U.S. government agency you did not mention is the CIA, and well, I figure they are different in a sense, you know, not law enforcement esque. Uh, no, they correct, but the the FBI is not solely law enforcement. We're we're also a domestic intelligence service, and and therein lies a little problem uh, because we're overseas, the CIA is overseas, and there we have a lane and they have their lane, but sometimes those lanes cross. And they also cross sometimes in the United States. And if anybody read the 9-11 Commission report, the 9-11 Commission report would cite uh, numerous failures in, in cooperation and open channels of communication between both services that have since been uh, cleared up. Um, let, let me just take the time to explain that, that the FBI works in the US Embassy in what is now the U.S. Embassy Jerusalem, but for the long time was U.S. Embassy Tel Aviv. And, and within the embassy, all the federal uh, government agencies work. So whether it's Department of Homeland Security or whether it's the Department of State, we all work together. And what makes that interesting is we, we have uh, many of us who don't work for the State Department, we have two masters. So one is the U.S. ambassador who is whether a career diplomat or a political appointee. And in Israel, they tend to be political appointees. Uh, so we serve them and we also serve in our organization, the director of the FBI. Um, so, so there's a lot of deconfliction that goes on in an embassy between the various entities to make sure that we're all dotting I's and crossing T's and serving the US government and its interests. So in the discussion about Iran, well, uh, since the CIA is external intelligence and we are internal intelligence, uh, I don't remember whether it was two years ago or three years ago, but we, we as, the, as the FBI, made arrests in the United States of two Iranians who were, who were spying on the United States, in the United States, and collecting, uh, collecting intelligence. So Iran uh, continues to not only be a threat to Israel, but also to the United States. And I, I because I, I signed a document when I left the FBI that I can't talk about anything classified, clearly you, you all have heard and numerous talking heads have commented about, including the former director of the CIA, John Brennan, 
who has said that the, is, uh, the assassination of the Iranian nuclear scientist is, is, going, is, is not going to uh, come without repercussions. Now, Israel has not, um, has not claimed responsibility for it, but uh, I think the assumption is that, that Israel was responsible. Uh, Israel is obviously t targeting um, Iranian provocateurs uh, and will not tolerate anything that, look, Iran is an existential threat to Israel. Uh, and Israel takes it very seriously and devotes a great deal of human resources and financial resources to ensure that their existence uh, will, will not uh, be um, in any way uh, checked by Iran. So I, I, I hope um, between the lines, you're able to understand the, the answer that I'm giving there. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to skip one of the questions, but come back to, and that was more of like, you know, how does one become an FBI agent and the tests involved? I'm going to continue on the Israeli part of these uh, questions. So this is from Rina Shirot. She's not a, fran a fan of President Trump, but she has Jewish friends who love him in part because of his actions regarding Israel. Um, are changes anticipated regarding Israel from the Biden administration? And obviously, I assume this is speculation, whatever you answer. Yeah, so absolutely, right? I mean, we, we all only know what we know. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, I guess you could say they're concerned. They, they do. They, they, they really like Trump over here because he's done whatever they've wanted um, for the past few years. Um, different people have different views on, even though it's what they wanted, is it definitely, is it going to be good in the long run? But even going back to the Iran question, you look at some of these other relationships and partnerships that um, Israel with U.S. brokering has established, right, with these other Middle Eastern countries. And just in the past few weeks, a lot of that is because of the, the shared threat in, 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 um, to the stability of the region, right, from, from Iran. Um, but yeah, I guess they're waiting to see. But and again, it, this is speculation and, and personal opinion. I, I think that the, the, I don't know, stereotype or just assumption that, that Biden or a democratic government or a more liberal government is, is necessarily bad for Israel um, is overblown. Because, and, and, you know, they, they never, you know, they probably, I think it's consensus that they didn't, you know, love Obama, but nothing really changed under Obama. I mean, they, they were still given all the, the aid that they had always been given here uh, from the United States and, and, Nothing really changed, but they are fans of this administration uh, for sure. And it's going to be interesting to see um, what what changes. But you know, and again, with, with with trying you know walk trying to walk down the middle. But I, I think part of being politically objective is is acknowledging um, the good things that 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 you know the other side has done, and and being able to look at, at your own side and 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 acknowledging, um, you know, flaws and where things didn't fall short. I, I think it's been pretty amazing what has happened here in the last few years um, with Israel and, and the other partners. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what the new administration um, chooses to, to continue forward with. Thank you for answering that one. So um, I'm curious as well, I guess, to continue that part of that conversation for just a short moment. In the, in the sense of different administrations or even FBI directors that change, which doesn't happen as often, do you see that come down all the way down the line or not necessarily? I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said, just the, the Meaning, politics do you, of it. The, do you feel the changes or is it country to country, but in the sense of right. your role stays the same? Right. So I, I personally, and Carrie can uh, disagree or, or add in, I've always said that that was always an easy question, I guess, until more recently. I've always said that we, as the FBI, and especially at the working level, are, are above or below, however you want to look at the, the political fray. And it really doesn't affect us that much. And we, we just go about our business, um, right? We're, we're, we're defending the Constitution and the people of the United States. I mean, and that's our job. We, we, we follow the facts. They take us where they are, whatever the investigation is, and we provide try to prevent um, harm uh, to the country. Clearly we've been politicized in, uh, in the last few years. So I think more so than in the past, we've, we've sort of felt um, the changes, but I, I, I think, but generally speaking, even that being said and acknowledged, 
we still just go go about our work and especially like like if the ambassador changes yeah they may run the you know the the, the embassy a little bit differently but we're still working with our foreign liaison partners to prevent acts of terrorism uh against both of our countries and uh um enforce the law in both of our countries thank you um okay carrie you want did you want to add to that or uh, how can I top Rusty's eloquent response? <laughs> All right, so here is a question from the chat, and this is more about the personal side of your work. Show the PowerPoint. By the way, I think the PowerPoint's great. I love it. Why doesn't Carrie like it? Yeah. Had to go and review yeah. it. Um, okay, so here's a question more on the personal side for both of you. Um, this is from an Israeli on here, Shoshi. And she said that she definitely can identify with what you described about the life in Israel. She's curious about the life of the families of the agents traveling with them all around the world. In other words, adjusting. I know, are they going to American schools and all of the details? So uh, it's, it's a great question. I, uh, a friend of mine who also served with me in Israel... Uh, a friend, a, a friend served with me in Israel. He, he's now our representative in Athens, and he said, um, "Raising children where you move every two to three years in multicultural environments, um, different languages, it, there's a um, a binary finish to this. You either raise a superhuman being, or you raise somebody who can only look at their shoes um, because they 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 can't assimilate." Uh, um, again, um, my children, they're now 14 and 11. They, they've moved every two to three years and they've gone to the American school in, in Israel and the American school in Singapore to a U.S. Department of Defense school in, uh, on the island of Guam. Uh, they're diverse, well-rounded. They appreciate different cultures and languages. My wife, who's Israeli, uh, really adapted well to Israel, um, but she hated Austria with a passion. Uh, um, She's yelling in the background, the cold of Austria and, and the, the people weren't so welcoming. So it's, a, it's a, certainly a unique lifestyle. Rusty's children, uh, I think, Rusty, your children probably speak better Hebrew than English now getting there <laughs> so it's it's a it's a it's a great journey for it's a great journey for the family assuming they're flexible and adaptable but there are many who serve abroad whose whose spouses significant others or or children ha have trouble adapting and uh and uh they curtail assignments and come back to the united states so it, it really is hit or miss hope that answers that question Yes, can I uh, jump in with, uh, I guess, a more controversial question of that? You know, a lot of us read the news about the diplomat's wife and the car accident in France. Was it France? Um, where she England. came back to the States, so she couldn't be prosecuted. Do you know the story I'm talking about, Rusty? Is that something the, that, uh, like, how do you look, how do you look at that? And I, I also understand, you know, you wouldn't want to be prosecuted. Did you get stuck? Say that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tragic, um, but but it happens. I mean, it, and it, it's always. Uh, you know, are you hearing me? Yeah, I, I mean, it's yeah. tragic, but but it happens. And I mean, there was there was nothing special um, about that case. That's what diplomatic immunity is, and I mean, that's that's basically just how it works. And, and uh, it's not good, but I mean that that it's the, the same protections are afforded to to their people to work in our country too and we have had situations uh like that also in fact i remember in washington dc when, when i worked there i, I think a, a russian diplomat um same exact thing had, had killed uh i think a teenager in a car accident um and they, they sent them home i mean it, that's that's what happens so that, i like your i mean it works both ways that, that's really the short answer to that all right, here is a question, um, just I guess more of a, a simple logistics question. 
the embassy was moved to, to Jerusalem, but is that sort of just a, this is a question from the chat, is that sort of just like a figure building, but really the offices remained in Tel Aviv or was it fully moved to Jerusalem? Um, it's fully moved, but they're still working on the logistics. I mean, they, they, they kind of did it quickly. They, they wanted to make the, the, the political statement. They, they, they hung the, the, the US seal on a building, but now they're building the infrastructure to actually uh, house the embassy, but they, it is in progress. Now we've always had a presence in Jerusalem already. There's a, there, it was a consulate, right? But this is a new building that is going to be the embassy and uh, there it's currently under construction. So uh, most of the offices are still being run, that were being run in Tel Aviv are still in Tel Aviv. But in the next few years, they'll have to decide who's physically going um, to move to the new embassy as it gets uh, built out. So uh, I'll just, um, sometimes I forget that I'm retired. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to talk now candidly. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a registered independent, but uh, I grew up the son, like, like many of us, uh, of Eastern European Jews who escaped uh, pogroms and atrocities in Europe and everybody on the Lower East Side of Manhattan was a Democrat, right? We, they, were, they were immigrants and poor and they, they voted down the Democratic ticket. Um, and, and to this day, although I'm, I'm declared an independent uh, and, and there's a reason I'm, I'm saying this, um, I'm, I'm a Democrat and I served in Israel 11 years for, for various ambassadors um, political appointees um, from, from President Obama, President Clinton, um, President Trump. And everybody was interested in solidifying the relationship between the Jewish community, Israel, and the United States. Uh, everybody took into account Palestinian issues. One of the things that Rusty and I have not talked about as representatives to the US Embassy in Jerusalem, we are also responsible for the Palestinian account. And we, we travel into Ramallah regularly. Um, when I was there in 99 to 01, I used to self-drive. There were two people in the embassy allowed to drive to Gaza. I used to drive to Gaza by myself. So we also have the Palestinian account. And I will tell you, again, as a retired person that that the Palestinians are helpful. They, 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 they have been helpful uh, to combating terrorism. Uh, but now I'll go back to the original question and, and, and that has to do with not, not just the move to Jerusalem because I was there for that move, but talking about politics in general. A as a Jew um, who's married to an Israeli, I was very proud. The U.S. ambassador to Israel now is a man named David Friedman, and he is President Trump's bankruptcy attorney. And they are, um, as far as I know, really, really good friends. This U.S. ambassador and the president were responsible for declaring, as the United States government, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And the Supreme Court is there, the Knesset is there, all the headquarters, the seat of government is in Jerusalem. And, and I was there the day that we celebrated the move to Jerusalem. And that's a big deal if you're Israeli. And for most people um, that are Jewish, that's a big deal. And I realize that there are two sides to the story. I don't want to get into a, uh, there's no reason to get into a political discussion as to how that uh, you know, affects the relationship with the Palestinians or the Arab world. I'm talking solely from an Israeli perspective and a personal perspective as a Jew. Um, the Israelis treasured this so much that Rusty and I got in a car and drove up north to a place called Kfar Trump. They, they named the city after him. So, uh, you know, I, I can't stress enough, Shoshi, you're Israeli, so, so you, you understand the importance of of having the capital declared as Jerusalem. So uh, this US ambassador has, has done from an Israeli perspective, wonderful things. Uh, and I, I would also assume 
um, you know, the relationship now with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Sudan, th these, are, these, are, these are dramatic steps. So I, I, I'm trying to remain apolitical, but what I'm saying is as I was there, um, there, were, there were special things that happened that various administrations had thought and sought to review for years and years that never came to fruition but did during my brief time there overlapping into Rusty's time. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to, that's, I mean, those are, I think from speaking to people over the last couple of years, that's, that's where people are, obviously it's like, you want, you like that. You don't like the guy who did it necessarily. And it's a perpetual Jewish struggle, I think in the community here and probably throughout the world for many, of course, you know, if, if you love Trump, everything was good. It's not a struggle, but but either way, to move away from that, um, back to, I guess, one last question from the chat. And then if someone has a question that we missed, they'll unmute their mic. This was more of a practical question. Um, both of you did not sort of aspire to be in the FBI. It, it sort of hit you somewhere else. And the question, I have a question I'm going to add to hers. Her question was really, what is the entry uh, type of testing that you need? And I am curious from knowing uh, um, other agents and different agencies. How often do you as a legal attache get involved in, I'm going to say the, the policing side of it in the sense where you have to sort of qualify with your weapon, be ready for uh, knocking down a door if you want to. I know in your role currently you don't do that, but do you have to always have that training maintained? So I guess start with the basics and then come back to that, which is the entry testing and what is required to become an FBI agent. Silence. Want to reminisce, Carrie? <laughs> you need to be, you mean, need to be between 23 and 37, have a four-year degree. Uh, my understanding is there are, there are some 20,000 applicants for a thousand jobs that open every year. We, we don't get paid a lot of money. Nobody joins government service to become rich. But in my class in Quantico, the question was asked, how many of you took a cut in pay to come work for the government? Remember I mentioned that I worked on Wall Street and 42 hands went up. So these are you know, highly motivated people, uh, especially in the post September 11th environment, there was a huge surge of folks coming in. Uh, the average age now is 31 to get in because we're looking for people with lots of uh, specialized experience mostly STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, math, cyber, and language specialties. Uh, the FBI is looking to become more diverse and reflect the United States population. We, we don't have enough in the way of minorities. We don't have enough in the way of females. Um, so, so today, speaking candidly, as a white male without any language skills, uh, I probably wouldn't get in. Rusty has a law degree and, and, and he, he would certainly go to a, a, an A or a B pile while I, I would be in a C pile with my military and finance degrees. Um, we are, even though we serve abroad, we, we have to qualify every quarter with our firearms. We have to pass a bureau physical fitness exam. Uh, we continue to take... Um, professional development training through something called Virtual Academy. And, uh, and um, did I miss anything, Rusty? Uh, no, so if you really are interested, because uh, whenever people ask me when they're, when they're young and really interested in the career, fbijobs.gov like literally lays out the whole process. And I only say that because I think it's changed <laughs> since when Carrie and I came in. But generally, I, I want to just answer. Um, like Carrie said, you have to meet. The, the, Rusty, the, Rusty, I don't know that our uh, age group can apply. <laughs> but their grandchildren can. That's true. <laughs> you said if you're really interested. Yeah, like <laughs> Carrie said, their grandchildren can. But I said I send people because it, it lays out the process uh, very clearly. But you you have to have the. The, the four year college degree and uh, three years work experience, unless you have uh, specialized skill sets. So that, that is why for a lot of people, it, it's, a, it's a second career. 
you know, and I, I talk to a lot of people, especially nowadays, because, you know, you can study national security and a lot of these things that didn't exist as academic disciplines uh, when we were younger, they do now and, and they want to come right in. But it's difficult because you're competing with people that, that have had life experience. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a written test um, and uh, a very difficult written test. And then, and then once you pass that, then you submit like your full application with literally everywhere you've ever lived and contacts and the whole thing so they can do your background. And then you have an interview with, with a panel of uh, three FBI agents. And, and then the, after that, then it's just about background and, and, and medical and uh, stuff like that. But, 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 big if, if, is, but you know, they want you to like a lot of jobs these days, right? They want you to, go ahead. Well, you, you clearly by looking at the camera, many of you are not able to join the FBI as special agents, including me now, but you can always help out. And I'll give you a quick example. I talked about an undercover case that I worked, but I worked a second one in Phoenix. I worked a, a boiler room operation. What's a boiler room operation like? the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. I was, I was in a basement calling senior citizens trying to sell them bogus stocks. I'm sure many of you have gotten calls from telemarketers who are looking to sell you something. Um, the, the way our bread and butter is when, when US citizens call the FBI or local law enforcement and let us know that something's going wrong and you know somebody, somebody in the chat I think said we could be great undercovers at our ages, but but beyond that, um, you, you can provide information to us and intelligence to us. And many people don't know what to do when they, you know, like these days we talk about, especially after the tragedy in the Tree of Life shooting in Pittsburgh and at the Chabad in Poway and at the Chabad in Mumbai, you know, you know see something, say something, but it do doesn't always have to be as it relates to terrorism. It can be, with day-to-day -day crime. So there's a quick pitch. And, and along those lines, tree of life stuff, I, I, I think it's wonderful that there are entities now that are involved in training Jewish communities and greeters, ushers on how to have situational awareness. You know, somebody on a, on a hot sunny day is coming up the steps wearing a, a, a raincoat um, well, maybe somebody should do something or say something and, and what are the, how, how do you exit the synagogue if God forbid you hear uh, loud noises that are clearly coming from a Kalishnikov. So, so along those lines, and I realize this is kind of a silly segue about, about how to become a special agent of the FBI into how can you be an asset for us, but also I segue into how, how do you have the situational awareness to also protect yourselves after after the tragic things that have happened with anti-Semitism, right? You you read about the the Boogaloo Boys and what's the other one, Rusty, that the president said? Proud Boys. The Proud Boys, right? Proud the president boys. gave a gave a shout out to the Proud Boys. Um, anti-Semitism is is not going away, never will. Um, so whether it's it's a swastika drawn on a shul or whether it's a, a crazy person looking to hurt somebody, um, we, we, need, we need citizens to let us know what's going on. Okay, sorry about that little digression. No, that's great. We actually brought, we, we've done through the Zoom as well, a run, hide, fight style of a presentation for seniors specifically. Um, I guess someone's asking, who do they call? This is privately. Um, I mean, I understand you call the local 911. It's not like you call FBI. local 911 for an emergency. No, uh, for tip. You you know something type of a thing. Uh, de depending on the nature of the tip, um, the the FBI has an uh, it's like I triple C the internet. What is it, uh, Rusty? IC three the Internet Crime Complaint Center, right? Yeah, Criminal Crime Complaint Center. Yeah. Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3. Right. IC3. So if, if you're, you're seeing scam, my, my aunt lost, uh, my aunt lost $100,000 through something called business email compromise, where, where she thought she was getting an email from her advisor and it wasn't her advisor and she wired money to a, an account that wound up going into 
uh, a basement in Romania. No kidding about those kinds of things. So, so just you know, be aware. You're 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 at the ages where you're vulnerable, and you hear from somebody, and and we we see it every single day. Um, so the Internet Crime Complaint Center IC3, um, your local FBI offices, you, know, you call them and let them know what your problem is, and they'll certainly let you know whether it's something that should go to the Phoenix PD, the Scottsdale Peoria, whatever PD, or whether or not there's an interest. And I'll just give a shout out to our local um, FBI here who have been tremendous um, connecting to the communities, not just the Jewish community. For us, it's a special agent, Dan Johnson, who does not know you both, I asked, um, but uh, he is, I've met him because of exactly what he does, outreach, uh, so he has a relationship with the different communities, so that's been really um, great here in Arizona. It couldn't be Dan Bluestein, it has to be Dan Johnson. Totally, totally from Texas. The, By the way, <laughs> uh, which, which is another thing to talk about, uh, I said earlier that that we want to reflect the Jewish population, uh, the population of the United States with black agents and female agents and whatever. I gave a lecture when I was in Guam to, to the Jewish community of Hawaii, Chabad, all the various islands came and I asked them what they thought the Jewish population was in the United States. And, and the answer was, I don't want to pose the question to everybody, but the answer was somewhere between eight and 10%. This is the Jewish population saying this. And it's slightly less than 3%. And in the world, it's one tenth of 1%. But in the FBI, there aren't, there, we're not 3% of the population in the FBI. We're a very small percentage of the population in the FBI. Why? Because most Jewish parents raise their children to be doctors and lawyers and not carrying a gun. It's a shanda to carry a weapon. Um, but th th there, are, there are a few of us, and it turns out that Rusty and I were you know, two Jews who served in Israel. Rusty's deputy there is a Jew. Um, so just you know, quick, a, a quick talk about the Jewish I mean, community. Rusty, is that is, Rusty mentioned it does, it does not help you get the job in Israel. It just happened to be that he was stationed out there. At least uh, maybe with you, I don't, I'm curious how you were tasked to open up the office in Israel, which is pretty amazing. Um, was that because you were Jewish or was just that was the stage you were at in the FBI? Nobody, my last name is Gleischer. Everybody thinks I'm German. So it had nothing to do with being Jewish. Uh, nothing at all. In fact, it's the first, the first deputy to leave Yadamon in Jordan, Wayne Zaidman, was Jewish to Jordan. So there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to it. There's no rhyme or reason, but opening up the office in 1996, my grandfather was a Zionist. You know, it, my whole life, you know, whenever, whenever I would go to shul with him, the rabbi would, would finish his sermon and say, anybody who's leaving for Israel, please stand up. Like in the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, you're going to visit Israel. It was like the biggest deal in the world. And you know, 1996, I'm landing in Tel Aviv for the first time in my life. And I had never traveled outside the United States really. And it was just a remarkable, remarkable experience to represent the, the US government as a Jew in Israel. Amazing. Any last questions? I know um, everyone's still on here, Carrie. That's just, and Rusty, that's just goes to show that you, they, they just, there's just so much more information they would listen to, myself included. Um, but if there are any questions, please do uh, unmute your mic or share it in the chat. But if not, I'm going to, in the meantime, say thank you to both of you, first of all, for your service. Okay, Rena has a question. Were there psychological tests? And then I guess to continue that, are there continuous psychological tests? Uh, yes, the, the the written test that I drove out is actually it's like um, you know like behavioral uh, profiling. They 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 are doing like a psychological profile on you, and you 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 don't really know it when you look at your peers. I remember when I was in the FBI Academy, and you're looking around, you're wondering how you ever got here, and you're looking at the guy next to you and wondering how he got there. And there's people like I said, we're we're, we're from all kinds of diverse backgrounds and careers and walks of life. 
but when they they did one of these behavioral batteries you know where you get a letter and a number and every and everyone took this test and like 98 percent of the class all had the exact same personality profile so it's they do know what they're doing but it's not so direct you're not you're not doing psychological um tests per se and um except that we do go through um national security background investigations every five years, they don't do psychology, uh, psychological testing uh, beyond that, uh, unless specific issues arise. Thank you. I see that there are two people who unmuted their mic. So Judy, did you wanna ask a question? Yes, I actually put it in the chat. I recently oh, read that um, the um, talks and the um, interrelationship with the Saudis and the Israelis is disintegrating. I hope that's not the case. But I wondered um, if you heard anything on that. R Rusty, uh, I don't know whether you would want to address the Saudi-Israeli relationship. Um, in Florida, I haven't heard a thing. <laughs> Other than, you know, open source what you're reading. Rusty, I don't know if you want to touch on that. That, that was completely broken for me. So Carrie, could, do you hear? Yeah, we hear you. I think you uh, froze for, for a minute. The question was, if the relationship with Israel and the Saudis has begun to disintegrate or not, she's hoping not, but is that something you could cover or not? Uh, I, I Politically, I, I mean, I, I read what everyone else is reading, and that stuff's happening at, at a higher level, um, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, you never know. A lot of this stuff, uh, I, I think it's it's changing rapidly and it's very dynamic and, and, and everyone's hoping for the best. And um, a lot of times, you know, some of the other topics, mut their mutual interests and mutual enemies sometimes lead to strange bedfellows. So uh, I think yeah. all we can do is, is wait and see. But I will say, Judy, I, I, I find it fascinating having been in Israel when a Hamas operative was killed in a Dubai hotel, supposedly by the Mossad, that less than a decade later, because the, the Emiratis were, how do I say this tactfully, were pissed off that there would be an assassination on their soil of a Hamas operative by a, by a visitor, that less, less than a decade later, the government of Israel and the United Arab Emirates are, are striking not only a political partnership, but also an economic partnership. There's a, there's a video out there where an Israeli is in a supermarket showing, showing where the produce is. Cucumbers are from Israel. Oranges are from Israel in an Emirati supermarket. And it's unfathomable to me a decade less than a decade after an assassination took place on their soil. So uh, this is a Sunni Shia issue and the Sunni world, the Arabian Peninsula is, their enemy is not the Jews, but it's the Iranians, Sunni Shia. Uh, so it, it would, it's sh it shocked me how far things have, uh, and how quickly things have gone that I, I, I think uh, inertia was, has been broken and will continue. That's my just opinion. That's, that's my hope. I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime. It was a complete shock. And as much as I don't like Trump for other reasons, I will always um, give this to him as the impetus. He, he thought outside the box for sure. and wasn't pussyfooting around like the others. Not to be political at all. <laughs> Point taken. Uh, I wanted to, I noticed that Penny before had unmuted her mic. If she has her question, uh, she should, Penny, re, I guess, unmute your mic again. If, if, the, if I don't see that, um, if you have the question later, I can email Carrie if it's a question that he can answer via email. Um, but I do want to thank both of you again for your service and Rusty uh, continued service. And thank you both for your presentation today. I mean, this was very informative and, and very appreci we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to join you.